the scene was Russell E. Dietrich Park, August 3rd, 2000. Eddie Fainer, the preeminent fast pitch pitcher and the king of the king and his court, regaled the crowd on his 55th year of barnstorming throughout the country. Clearly, Eddie Fainer, the king, continues a long history of barnstorming ballplayers. Attendance during the war years suffered too. And in an effort to encourage more fans to attend games, team owners came up with several outlandish contests involving players. The winners receiving no more than a $100 war bond. continued, some with celebrities from outside baseball like Jesse Owens, who raced and barely beat George Case of the Cleveland Indians in 1946. In the early 50s, stars like Abbott and Costello would make occasional appearances at ballparks. Here, they're at a Boston Braves game, answering the question of, who's on first? In the 30s and 40s, it was not unusual to see players or coaches participate in comedy sketches for the newsreels. In this case, the foil is Benny Bengal of the Washington Senators. Comedy and baseball have had a long and entertaining partnership. Former pitcher Al Schacht, who was known as the Clown Prince of Baseball, appeared at 25 World Series, including the 1940 Series at Tiger Stadium. When Schacht retired in the early 50s, it was Max Patkin who inherited the title of Clown Prince. Amazingly, Patkin performed not only before the game, but during it as a legitimate first base coach. Max Patkin. When I do my routine, I try to do it between pitches. I usually have between 10 and 15 seconds. Do you be surprised what 10 seconds means to a Max Patkin on the coaching line? So it gives me a chance to go through that goofy thing of motion with my neck, my arms, my legs, just to make out I'm giving a sign to the batter. That would give me just enough time. All I needed was 8 to 10 seconds. Bing, 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 bop, boom, ba, that. And you know, and I, then when I looked at those days, I'm telling you, I was the dumbest looking thing you ever saw in that coaching line. Hey, Fainer is the last of a breed of Barnstormer. And we had the pleasure to interview Ed together with his lovely wife, Ann, on August 3rd, 2000. Here is Eddie Fainer, the king of the king and his court life story. How did Eddie Fainer think about softball? Uh, I was an orphan uh, because of an in-house fathering of a baby in an unwed situation. There was this man that was playing in the hay with two sisters. Mm -hmm. He married one and he had the other one pregnant. Mm -hmm. This is a quick synopsis of why it happened. I was wrapped up in a pink blanket and left at the back door of a hospital. And uh, the father of that situation had 13 kids, eight of them in school. He said, we just can't have this kind of embarrassment with a father of that baby being married to the other. Just can't have it. Mm -hmm. I could see his point now. It would work now. But back in those days, man, that's the end of the story. So it almost killed my mother because she got out of bed and tried to find me mm -hmm. and she almost died because of the hemorrhage because she just had this baby so she lost contact with me from the very first the doctor who delivered me 
died in a fire of his home the very next month. And I dis disappeared. Well, the people that raised me, I met her in, in a hospital when, she, when I was a day old. She had had uh, midlife birth to a baby she named Mary and Eugene, and uh, to save the baby would have killed her. So they, kept, they saved her and let the baby die, because it wasn't going to be a healthy baby anyhow, 52 years married, I mean 52 years old pregnancy. So uh, she was afflicted with what they call breast can a breast fever. And back in those days, the medical industry didn't know how to handle breast fever. Right. And they would give these hand pumps and keep right. the zone. So the doctor one day says, this lady's not going to make it. What we needed is that little guy suckling her because that would have kept the fever down. Right. And the nurse said, well, how about that little guy we brought in last night? And the doctor said, what are you talking about? He said, well, we got a little boy in last night. He said, run and get him. So anyhow, they brought me up there, and I uh, nursed her, and within a week she was well. And then they were going to send her home, and uh, they asked the doctor, what are we going to do about that little guy? And, and uh, they said, we've named him already. His name is Merle Vernon. And he said, well, if someone comes to get him, we'll know where it's at. And might as well go on home. So she was so sick, she didn't go to church. She hadn't been to church for a year. Now this year-old baby is in her arms. She never told a single person at church that the other baby died. Mm -hmm. He didn't have an official burial. They just put him out in the backyard because he was, wasn't fully, you know. So uh, the uh, ladies at the church, oh, in there's a fine baby. And here she's proud that she had a baby that's this healthy at 52 years old. And so she never said, this is uh, not my baby. Right until uh, I grew up and uh, found out there was there was bastards and stuff and uh, used to get a lot of fist fights and when I was 10 or 12 years old uh, the professor at the college says you know you've got an exceptional child I want to check his, his uh, IQ and I had something over 150 IQ and uh, uh, I learned to play a piano all by myself I learned how to play a saxophone all by myself the guy said, when you learn to play a, a note, a stanza on this sax without making a mistake on the note, you can have the sax. And the next day he came back from school. I'm sitting there on the front step, and he said, what are you doing? I said, I want to play that thing for you. He said, you can't play it. He said, yes, I can. So I played Moonlight and Roses. He said, the sax is yours. So that's the way I was. It's amazing. So I got up to uh, show off for Mrs. King when we were at a... At a Bible study, and the Bible study was with the German church and the English-speaking church because of Hitler and Europe, and the women from the German side want to be friends with the English-speaking side because of uh, their husbands didn't get along. Right. If you're a German, you so anyhow, I'm at that Bible study, and I get up in front to recite the Beatitudes or whatever it was. And uh, after I got through, I came by Mrs. King to tell her I'm going to go outside and play, ask her if I could go outside and play. And a lady was sitting right to her left. And uh, now we know it was my mother's mother. Mm. We call her Gross Mother. And she says to Mrs. King, oh, you must be proud of your son. And Mrs. King says, well, he's not our son. We got him at the hospital. No one wanted him. He was wrapped in a pink blanket. Rose mother had wrapped that pink blanket around me when they took me out of her house, and and she lived for almost 15 more years and never told her daughters, "We know, I know where your son is," because her daughter had lived another life, married happily going on. Mrs. King had nobody except this little boy, and Gross mother was going to take that idea and that knowledge to the grave. In fact, you actually cut your gross mother I, I used mother's to cut lawn, her yard. but they didn't know the that they were related. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, what, is, what city is, was this, by the way? Where? College Place, Washington. It's a town of about 1,200 people. Yeah. And it's just a college town. Adventist college town. The sick people. The, I don't know. That's a, not a good say. It's not, they're uh, fanatical religious, like mm -hmm. 
like you, you never see them. You don't, they don't wear lipstick, they can't dance, they don't wear rouge, they don't even use perfume. I mean, it, they're supposed to be like they were in the Garden of Eden, pure and, oh. you know, they don't eat meat and everything. Anyhow, uh, that's another story. But uh, through the process of checking the records, getting out of the Marine Corps with the disability, going to Grouse Mother and finding out that and Naomi was still there. She was selling her home. I came over to see her. We had a dinner, spent tw uh, 48 hours talking. And after that, uh, she says, uh, you can be anything you want, do anything you want. And I was giving her some money and uh, this house is yours. And I said, no, I didn't come for the house or the money. But I will take the car. And uh, I said, I'm a ball player. And she said, well, you do what you want to do. So she sent me to college for a couple of years, and that's when the King's Course started. Uh, we tried to uh, get the word up to you before you start. Three minutes ahead of time. It's the street will say. I got a warm up. Just a second. little of how you decided that you liked softball. Oh, well, by the time I was home uh, from school after I'd been sick, I didn't go to the first and second grade. Mm -hmm. So by the time I'm seven years old, I get well enough from having all the childhood diseases. I had about eight of them, mumps and measles and whooping cough and, and scarlet fever and so on. I had a setback in a scarlet fever and almost died and the nurse that taught the first and second grade was in charge of the first second and third grade so she had two rows of kids in the first grade two rows of kids in the second and two rows of kids in the third grade so i went back to school well the very first day i was there she had me over in the first grade and she moved me over the other side of the room to third grade so the first grade of school i ever went to was my third grade mm -hmm. That year, I met Mead Kinzer and uh, Meineke and White. They were in two other different schools, but we lived four blocks from each other. Wow. And uh, that's how it started. And uh, by the time I got to be nine or 10 years old, uh, every time you brought up the fact that I was a little bastard, or whatever it is, uh, and the ball game, uh, they couldn't foul it, let alone hit it. And that was uh, a real incentive for you. Oh, yeah. I, the only reason I became a good softball pitcher so that Bobby Blue couldn't pitch on the team. Yeah. And how about how you learned, you taught yourself, because you didn't have any men in your life, um, and there was no Little League, of how yeah. you threw rocks and practice. Well, and Satchel Page came through town. The first guy I ever saw pitch was Satchel Page. He was with the Kansas City Monarchs. 
and uh, like every kid, you go sneak in the fence and get in there somehow. And I watched him throw, and I got a, a uh, tennis ball, an old tennis ball, and I got out behind the barn, and I would pitch the game. I was Mel Allen, there he is, down, <laughs> third and second, strike ball. <laughs> you know, you did it. Well, they don't do Kids it don't anymore. Kids don't do that. No, 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 no. But back in those days, you yeah. announced your own game. And then uh, I got so good that uh, I got a little older. I pitched in the, the uh, what do you call it, the field day. Mm -hmm. They had college guys, high school guys, and the grade school. Mm -hmm. The seventh and eighth grade team played the college team, and we beat them. Wow. No kidding. And I pitched two baseball games and three softball games the same day, and they never scored in any of the five games. <laughs> so by the time I got to be 13 or 14 years old, I went up to be around the guys that played good softball, mm -hmm. and they pitched. The men. Yeah, the men, because yeah. they had no little league. And uh, so I pitched batting practice because I could throw windmill like these touring yeah. like the, like the ghosts and so on. And all those guys were pitching. It was orthodox. And son of a gun, the two pitchers on our team, we were the Washington State. They were the Washington State champions. The two pitchers on my team in 1938 peeled out their elbows as riding on a bicycle, a uh, motor. Motor, motorcycle and they were racing each other and they hit on this gravel road and they wrecked their knees and uh, their elbows and they couldn't pitch in the state tournament they were defending champions and the sponsor was considering just withdrawing mm -hmm. and uh, the catcher on our team says why don't we take the kid let's at least show up yeah. well <laughs> playing against guys that never threw never saw a windmill yeah <laughs> they either walked or struck out. There was no hit. Yeah. And I won the state tournament when I was uh, 14, got back home, and I was barred for life. They wouldn't allow me to play. The only way I could play in the league was play center field. They wouldn't allow him to pitch in his own hometown. If he had had a father, that would have never happened. Can you imagine your 13-year-old son, who was the, because he was so good, they wouldn't let him pitch in his own hometown? You mean that was the reason? You wouldn't be able to do yeah. that today because he was so good. They wow. said, if we have an eight-team league, and they know you're pitching in that one team, we won't get any sponsors for the other seven teams. Oh. So you can play center field and bat and all that. You can Just pitch. because you were so good? Yeah. Okay. And uh, I was good. By the time I was 14 years old, I could do everything I could do when I was 30. Yeah. I got my height at six <laughs> foot one, and I could throw a ball right through a wall. Yeah. And... Uh, I was strong as an ox because I had done all those uh, things you do as a young boy. I carried the bale of hay and then mm -hmm. milked uh, 32 cows. And Picking the peas. Yeah, all those things. You get strong oh, milking yeah. the cows. Oh, yeah. sure. Well, I could, I could do anything I wanted to with the ball, and I had perfect control. I had eyes that I have. Ted Williams and I have the same eye. Uh, it's called 1020. You're, you all, it, mm -hmm twice as good as a regular eye. That's the reason why he could see a ball spinning coming out of the fingers of a baseball pitch. That's why he became such a hitter. Is he saw the spin on the ball when it left the pitcher's hand. Not when it got out here, but back there. Hmm. When I first saw it play, it was called indoor ball. It's gone full cycle now, and they play a game called slow pitch. The problem is there's no self-respecting father is going to teach his son slow pitch, so the next generation won't have that game to play either. I'm not knocking slow pitch. It's a lot better than jogging. <laughs> well, anyhow, by 1934, they organized the game and they pissed it with a wrist snap. Men like Al Indy and shift the gears could throw the ball at 70 miles an hour. And with 32 feet, you couldn't hit it. Well, by 1939, the game became very popular. Lowell Thomas, who was a famous newscaster, told me that the 1939 Supreme Court for FDR had a softball team, the nine men on the bench were the team. Bob Ripley of Ripley's Believe It or Not had a team. He asked Lowell to put together an all-star group to play a game in charity 
at Madison Square Garden in 39. I golfed with Cannonball a couple of years ago, and he said this is a true story. He's about 86 years old now and still good health. He said when they got to Madison Square Garden, there sat Babe Ruth. The Babe came to bat three times and struck out three times in nine straight pitches. And after the third strikeout, the Babe took the ball away from the catcher and plummeted it up against the end of the building. And he turned to the crowd and said, I just want to see if the damn thing could be hit. Well, in 1940, I came along into the game, and the game had started to speed up. There were several of us that could throw windmill. Now, you'd have guys throw it in the middle of the windup and keep on winding up. You'd have guys throw it and then wind up. <laughs> I saw Archie Windmill Hamlin throw this pitch so good. If the batter swings to late, when the catcher throw it back, the batter see it, thought he hit it, and took off for first. <laughs> now we have the windups like the figure eight. The straight slingshot. The whip. The rewind. The spin with a rewind. <laughs> I like that one. Now we were on the road about five years before we kind of realized that you fans like to see tricks. But she wouldn't travel with us. Smart <laughs> girl. So we started throwing tricks in the game like behind the back. Behind the back change up softball team. I ended up striking those fellows all out and I got maze behind the back and Clemente between the legs. But it was a lot of fun and I enjoyed being out here. You started on a deer. Yeah, well that game, uh, th that's the way we say it started there. That isn't really true. We started over an insult. Insult? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, we played this uh, Oregon State champion, and we were the Washington State champion, and the dam between Oregon and Washington on the Columbia River is the same place, so they were working on the same dam we were. Right. They just saw on the other end. And so we had a lot of money, and they had a lot of sponsorship, so they sponsored softballs. The guys that had the construction company on Oregon side, and then our guys over on this side, Turling. And this particular one night, I wanted to pitch good, and uh, we ended up striking everybody out. And I'd done that before, and through my life, I did it over 200 times. But this particular night, it was a smart mouth guy on the bench, and he called me something about my ancestors. Mm -hmm. And being an orphan, I you could get a good fight of me, called me a little bastard. And uh, so I went over. Well, I was a basically Christian man, and I never did say very many bad things back in those days. I learned to do that when I was in range, but at that time I was just I was just trying to be uh, nice and I said, you know, it wasn't very hard to strike out twenty one of your batters. They're not very good. I play I'd play with my catcher. I'd play with my catcher, but you'd walk us both. You, know? right. you can imagine playing this team all both guys walk. <laughs> I know. So where would you be? Anyhow he said, you think you're so smart. You bring your shortstop, first baseman, and catcher down here, and we'll play you. I told you this story yesterday. Yeah, right. Well, what he had made up his mind right there is you have to have a short first and catcher to have a fourth person bat with the bases loaded. Mm -hmm. And that was in the end of the story. We beat him, and uh, the next night, the next week, we got a call from Boise. We played them. Our gate. Uh, was going to be $100, and they said, no, we were going to give you half the gate because it wouldn't be fair just to give you $100. We sold tickets. Well, they sold 25-cent tickets, and we had 4,000 people. Our half the, no, 2,000, no, 6,000 people. Our half of the gate at 25 cents a ticket came to $960. <laughs> and uh, we got back home that night, and I told the guys, I said, you know, if we played five or six games a week, 15 weeks during the summer from April to August. That'd be better than working. Yeah. 
Mm. Well, we've played to almost 39 million people. Wow. Thank you. The game's gonna be blindfolded. I got one eye, and the other part can't see. <laughs> when it comes to impressing it. I, I was impressed only just to see how unimpressed they were. Good answer. <laughs> uh, you know, Gorbachev and uh, Mousy Tongue. Mm -hmm. These are just dumb people. They're, they got the public around them and they're all scared of them. Yeah. And they talk good and they have, they have a mercenary background. But they're just dumb people. They don't know nothing about anything. Yeah. But they run the world. Yeah. And uh, so, when you get right down to it, the people I've met are the guys that's going to die in the next three weeks of muscular dystrophy, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. or the oh, guys that we dealt last week with the cancer kids down there in Kansas City. This little boy, I like to tell this story, I'm going to tell it for the rest favorite. of my life. He's 10 years old, he was going to live maybe another month, he had no hair because he'd had chemotherapy. It was making him so sick they were going to stop the chemotherapy because it was just ruining his life. They was afraid to play him in the game. And so as the game went on, we said, well, let him stand down at third base, mm -hmm. play third base short. <laughs> so holding this bat out here like this, I could see where the ball should be pitched. <laughs> and he swung at it and missed oh. it. And a couple more swings, he whacked it out there almost mm -hmm. to me, about 20, 30 feet. Mm -hmm. He ran the first. 
he wasn't supposed to run. He ran the whole thing over to third base. He was almost, he was almost collapsed because he shouldn't have been running. Mm. Uh, no lungs. Yeah, yeah, right. go home. And uh, they let him go home. Eddie Fainer has been all over the world showcasing his tremendous talents. In fact, he was invited to attend the United States Olympics that occurred in as a representative of the Olympic team in Australia this past Olympics. Tiger hunt. If oh, he's yeah. doing his history, this is perfect. Yeah, I love it. This is great. This is history. When you're over there under those conditions, the guy that you operate out of is the office of the ambassador. Mm -hmm. And uh, you have secret missions and you have secret places you're going to go because there's certain people you want to meet and you don't want anyone to know you're meeting them. Oh, yeah. And then you can turn, that, turn the information you know back to the, the uh, congressional uh, committee that in charge of this. Right. And when you get through reporting, they'll say, now you reported, don't go home and buy all you know to the local people because we'll deny it anyhow. <laughs> so this particular one, I'm over there in India and we're, we've done about five or six shows. And uh, I taught the guys that played cricket how to, the difference between cricket and softball. And I started the India's Softball Association. Hmm. And they had about 600 teams they played cricket. They promised they would play softball. Oh boy. So the division of India and Pakistan came in 1948. And when uh, they divided like the, just like the Bosnia and Dow and the, and the Irish, they kill the other, whatever the ethnic group is, is bigger, kills what's left of the other. Well, the Indians and Pakistanis killed each other along that border. Well, finally all the Pakistanis went to Pakistan Finally, all the Hindus went over to India, so they stopped killing each other. But while this was all going on, the British government was going to turn all the rail, all the uh, rooting stuff over to them. They were going to be independent. India is independent from England, even though England basically had owned them for four or five hundred years. So one of the steps that the Indian people asked for was all of the land back. Well, to do that, the British Crown had to take all the land back from the Maharajas. So the Maharajas had a written free title to millions of acres. So they abolished the uh, office of Maharaja, except for one. He owned a fifth of India, and he wasn't about to not be the Maharaja. <laughs> <laughs> well, this guy that owns all of the land on, her, on the top a fifth of India, that whole thing up there. Beautiful trees and the Bengal tigers come from there and so on. He uh, sent word to the ambassador that they were going to have a tiger hunt mm -hmm. and that they wanted to have the ambassador come over because he was going to politic the ambassador about different things. And so the ambassador said, I don't want to talk to him. He says, he's going to put me in a position. I don't have an answer. So you go. You go and <laughs> represent me. Well, I went over like I was told to do, and I went over there, and they got they got uh, just five or six elephants out, and uh, the guide explained to me that we're going to ride out in the jungle, and you're going to get off these elephants, and you're going to be in a little tree house, and they're going to kill a goat, or at least wound it, down below, tie it up with a stake, and uh, the tiger is going to be in the area because we have six miles circle with natives and they're closing a circle around this tree and they know that there's some tigers in that circle. Well, when the tiger comes over to kill the goat, you don't say a thing, you don't move, don't make any sound because the tiger will jump and run away. But they can smell you for a mile and they hear anything. So I know, okay. So during the night we got to talking different things. He says, now, in the morning, the tiger, oh, he, he, the tiger came in and tried to take the goat away, tried to kill it, and uh, did kill it. 
but he couldn't take it away because it was nailed to the ground. Well, all tigers eat, drink their, uh, wash their food before they eat it. So the, the tiger was going to take it down to the creek and wash it. I guess they don't like the blood. Anyhow, the tiger couldn't get it off the stake. So he sneaks off back in the brush. The guy says, now in the morning at daybreak, he's going to sneak back in here and try to take that goat away. When he does it, he'll finally settle down because he's been hungry all night. He's going to settle down and eat the goat. And when he, he's quiet and his head's still, he'll put a bullet right between the top of his head. Mm -hmm. Point blank, like this. Yep. I said, I wouldn't do that for a million dollars. I said, I, I wouldn't kill that tiger that way for nothing. I would kill a tiger who would charge at me and jump in the air and right. I'd shoot him. I'd yeah. do that. But I said, I'd never kill that tiger. Good for you. You talk about people getting upset. <laughs> they, they put me on an elephant, sent me back down the thing, and my stuff was sitting in the road outside, and a really dirty letter was sent to the ambassador for sending that ungrateful American out there. But uh, for what it was worth, I was, that was true. I mean, I, I can't even hit a deer when it's in full run. If it's, you know, hell, hell, it was helpless. It's a if I was going to go kill a deer, it would be because I was hungry. I was going to eat it. Sure. And just to kill something because it's there to kill, sure. I can't stand it. And then to have a pot shot at it, just point blank, just... That's... Anyhow, that's... Like Thankful that anyone who fantasizes about the life of a man and 50s, that road was well-traveled. Every small town seemed to have backwater towns. When the major leagues didn't exist... And, uh, 15 or 20 dollars a year so outfielder Gus Zerniel in the Coast League we had a lot of guys that made more money than when I went to the big leagues the first time they asked while the Coast League treated its play not that the miners were oh, you look good Bob player uh, Chuck was uh, the first baseman for the Hollywood baseball minor league team and a uh, Hollywood producer said, you you look like a big cowboy on the western with a hat on. Mm -hmm. And uh, he says, no, I don't know nothing about anything. I, I don't want to be an actor. And I said, well, you'll pay you 5000 a week. <laughs> well, what do I do? He says, we're going to call it the Rifleman. Yep. Uh -huh. Or tell him about Neil Diamond. Yeah. Well, Neil Diamond is the same story. Uh, when you meet a guy that's just getting started, like Big Crosby or Andy Williams, I knew those guys before they were who they are. Mm -hmm. And uh, Andy Williams started out singing with his brothers. He was a quartet. Mm -hmm. And uh, just, uh, who was that? what was I going to say? I lost Neil Diamond. Right. Oh, Neil Diamond. We're down at uh, spring training. We just always went down to Florida to spring training in February before the major league started because once they started the ballparks were taken <coughs> so we would actually work out before and we would play around florida because all of the canadian snowbirds were down there and we'd draw big crowds in cities that didn't have minor league special particular time that i was down there uh the uh boy i, I, I know the stories run together here uh, we're talking about uh Neil Diamond. Neil Diamond. Thank you. Oh, yeah, Neil Diamond. And we're at the, uh, the motel at uh, Congress Inn there in Tampa. And we are staying for about five or six days in this same motel. And we're going to St. Pete. We're going down in Tampa and so on. So we're going to be there for a week. Well, Pete Rose is there in his first year trying out for the baseball. He and his wife are there in that same motel. And a guy in the in the lounge, there's a bar in this side here, and the guy in the bar, in the lounge, was sitting over in that corner up on a stool, and he could turn over here and play the piano, and he could play the guitar, and he would sing. And there was about eight couples in the room. Well, he sang. It's about 9.30, 10 o'clock, because we'd already played our game and came back. Mm -hmm. It was, should be quite a crowd, there was nobody there. And uh, so after he got through singing, he came walking in and I said, can I buy a drink? He said, no, I don't, 
I don't drink, I'll have some uh, lemonade or whatever, water. And I said, boy, you have a, you have a really a great voice. And I said, you, the way you sing a song is so, so different. He says, yeah, he says, the people haven't caught on to it yet. <laughs> <laughs> no, then he asked you, well, what do you think of what I do? Yeah, and I, I told him that I, th I thought he was terrific. And he said, well, thank you. My name is Neil Diamond. Oh, my <laughs> gosh. <laughs> achieved a rare triple crown in fabulous fashion. As soon as he came up to the majors in 1951, it was clear that this farm boy from Commerce, Oklahoma, was something special. Mantle had all the tools in abundance. He could run, field, throw. But most of all, he could hit. Man, could he hit. His first five years in New York were outstanding. And then in 1956, Mickey Mantle put on one of the finest single season performances in Major League history. I think I built up to it, you know, 52, I hit 353, 54. It was just like I was just getting up there, you know. Uh, uh, it just took me five years to do what they said I could do in 1951. His triple crown numbers from that 56 season are absolutely mind-boggling. Listen, home runs, 52, RBIs, 130, batting average, 353. I don't think there's any question that he may have been the greatest slugger of all time. I know this, there, there was probably never one year that one player had, like Mickey had when he won the triple crown, when he had over 50 home runs and hit 350 or whatever it was, and could steal bases that well and could throw and run. I don't think there's ever been a combination of sheer power and sheer speed uh, other than Mickey Mantle. I envied him in a way where he played on so many great teams, uh, but Mickey was one of the great players I've ever seen, and uh, I marveled at him, and I've, I've always said he was the best player I ever played against. Uh, all the pain and all the problems he had with his uh, physical, his legs uh, being a big problem. And I just marvel at a guy who could uh, uh, go through all that pain and still be a tremendous player. Mantle's injuries may have reduced his overall speed, but not his power at the plate. Mantle swings. There goes a long drive going to deep right field. It's soaring up high. It's going. It's going. It is gone. A home run for Mickey Mantle. And it almost went out of the ballpark. Mickey Mantle for the second time in his career has come within a few feet of becoming the first man to ever hit a ball clear out of Yankee Stadium. Mick was named American League MVP in 1956 and eventually he was inducted into baseball's Hall of Fame. But with all his brilliance, his pride and character make Mantle feel he could have accomplished even more. I was really lucky. I played with, uh, with the greatest teams in the world, so I don't really have uh, any gripes, but uh, I, really, I really do believe if I had another shot at it, I could do better, and that's what bugs me. The magnificent Mickey. There's a fly ball out to right field. That ball is... If you are a batter in baseball, you have seen a ball come in, a real fastball that they strike out on, goes up about two inches. Mm -hmm. It's just a high fastball that just rises a hill. Mm -hmm. And that's a, if you're a good pitcher, that's the one you give for the third strike because they'll hit at the ball and a ball just goes up enough. They all throw curves, drops, gravity is revolved in baseball. Softball is just the opposite. You have to purposely throw a ball into the ground because the ball is so low to the ground. If you bring it up at any and drop it, you drop it right in the hitting zone. So for you to throw a drop like they would say in baseball would be a sucker pitch because they would just clock it. Yep. If you throw a raise that goes about eight inches up and in and out, have no idea what to do with it. So the easiest guy to strike out is a major league ball player. A minor league ball player who played softball as a kid probably would have hit it. But if Mickey Mantle and DiMaggio and Williams and, and uh, Babe Ruth. Pete all, Rose. Pete Rose. They have no idea how to raise the bat above the ball. Yeah. And it's not a big deal. Any good softball, any good softball pitcher could have done what I did that day. I don't think that's true, Eddie's very humble. 
But anyhow, behind uh, his back and between his legs is pretty uh, tough. Uh, <laughs> oh yeah. <laughs> but anyhow, the uh, the philosophy behind uh, the, the grandeur of hitting a ball. Uh, I pitched to Mickey Mantle about a hundred times and struck him out almost every time. Occasionally, he hit a long fly, and uh, he admitted he never played fast pitch when he was a young kid. I knew him ever since he was 14. And uh, after we'd done about 10 or 15 shows together, four or five shows a day for a whole week, he started fouling it off the bottom and hitting it up in the air. So after we'd gone through this a couple of weeks, I told him, I said, Mick, you know, we ought to choreograph this thing. Why don't I just throw you two fast races, and I'll give you one right down the slot, and you can hit it about 400 feet. The crowd will love that. <laughs> well, for the next 50, 60 days, we did that show. I would strike him out, and then he'd hit one a ton. Sure. And uh, Mick was a good guy. He and I drank more than our share. Started off at 10 o'clock in the morning with a pitcher of, of screwdrivers. And by the time we got to 4 or 5 o'clock, it was a pitcher of uh, martinis. martinis. And we did that every day for a week. And I'll see you in Kansas City next week. I saw him after we went out one night in uh, Chicago. They were in, the Yankees were in to play the White Sox. At 3 o'clock in the morning, he had a girlfriend. And he used to chase around pretty good. His wife understood all that, and they went through the divorce and went back together and everything. But he was the biggest thing in the world yeah. in sports. And all the girls chased him. We had this date that night, and and he was drinking, right? And we all drank. And uh, about 3 o'clock in the morning, he couldn't walk. So I put his arm over my arm, uh, on my shoulder, and she was on the other arm, and we walked him out to the cab, and she got in the cab, and she had to take him home. I got to thinking, they play a doubleheader tomorrow morning. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to get up and see what it's like. So I got up. And here he is, 11 o'clock, game time is at 12. He's standing there with the sun on his head, like this. <laughs> and Mickey always oh, says, I'll be all right today. He says, I just got out of an hour in the shower at the, the steam bath. I've got my knees wrapped. it will be all right. He went five for eight, that double hitter, and four home runs. Wow. <laughs> That's a great story. I, first time I saw him, he was just a kid, and he was trying out for the Kansas City Blues minor league team. And after we played our game first, mm -hmm. and then the baseball game was after, like, you know. And so after the game, he came over, and uh, on an autograph and all that stuff. And uh, he says, "What do you think? You think I got a chance in the bigs?" And I said, "I think you got it made. I don't see why in the world you couldn't be up there next year." I don't think you should play shortstop. I think you should be an outfielder. Well, a year later, he's an outfielder. Yeah.
Okay, that's the pitch again behind his back. Well, I didn't want them to tie it up with a little ground ball, so I reached out and caught As I told you earlier, I have arthritis, and, and I stand still for a while, I can't sit. what we've been told by yeah, the children right. today. They Elvis Presley well. uh, oh, played, played softball when he was a young kid, and he was on the uh, softball team that played in Tupelo. Mm -hmm. And this is before he went to Memphis with his mother and sang those uh, songs with the choir and so on. This is long before Parker. Mm -hmm. Then we met, and he was now the star, and he was Presley and could care less about us. And uh, we played a couple of games where he uh, was in the army, and he dropped by, just a friendly face, I didn't sit around. But he got out of the army, and that particular year, the guy that put on the game, the name of Adams, he was, had been a college, I mean, a high school buddy of Elvis's. Mm -hmm. and. Uh, they knew Kevin Wilson, who started the Holiday Inn and all that stuff. Kevin Wilson was a promoter. He used to have a crippled leg. One leg was five inches short of the left. Did you know that? No, I didn't know that. Well, Kevin Wilson put his old posters up, promoted, huh. before he started the Holiday Inn. Yeah. And uh, so Adam says, Ellie got home today. Why don't you go over and see him? I said, oh, he don't want that. Well, when, when we went over to see him. He had a girl back on the down port, and they were watching movies. He didn't want us to come there. We should have called. So after he did get up and say hello, uh, I said, what do you think of those Beatles? You know, I said, that's great music. He said, if they don't stop making those uh, claims, he said, I'm going to have to go back on tour and let them know who the king is. So in the next 15 or 20 minutes, we had small talk and so on, and he actually came to the game that night and sat in the outfield with a beard on him. Oh, yeah? Him. Yeah. Somebody pointed out to Eddie, yeah. said, look who that is out there in that car. Yeah. Looks like an old man and his wife in a shawl. <laughs> That's Ellie. But anyhow, uh, <laughs> on the way out, he says, uh, he knew I owned this little piece of business in Vegas. And he says, when you get home this fall, I'm going to be starting a tour out there in the, in the uh, Fremont Frontier or one of those. And he says, tell the guys that you're a guest of mine and come to the game, come, come to the show when they open. Mm -hmm. So that fall, I'm uh, out in, in Las Vegas at a golf tournament, like they have at the end of the... What happened is uh, I tried to get a ticket, mm -hmm. and, the, and the guys, you know, you're a good friend of Elliot. You know. Yeah, they all are. <laughs> so I went over to a guy's house, I went over to a guy's house by the name of Harold Ambler, who was the president of our country, company, and he had a girlfriend that was a widow of Wilbur Clark. And Wilbur Clark had the, doll, the Holiday Inn, I mean the yes. Desert Inn, and he started the Tournament of Champions Golf. So Tony Clark uh, had us at his house for cocktails, and, and uh, Harold Ambler and I was talking. She's in the other room. And I said, boy, I sure wish I could go see Elvis Presley. And I said, he told me to be his guest. But He's the only person that Eddie would ever want to go see in public. We don't go to baseball games. Eddie doesn't go to see concerts. But this is the only man that he had respect for that he really wanted to go see. Yeah. Hey. 
Delaney Al, Tony Clark owned Vegas after Wilbur Clark died. Mm -hmm. When she called the pit boss, things moved. <laughs> well, she called Mo Dalis, the godfather, oh, yeah. or someone else, and she came back after she hung up the phone. She says, you take a $100 bill, hold it in your left hand, walk up the VIP side, and you've got a seat. Okay. So I left, started out the front door, and she says, where are you going? I said, well, I, got I don't want to go like this. I, gotta, I had golf stuff on. But I want to go so he's cleaned up a little bit. She says, you going to go over there alone? I said, well, I don't know. She said, well, can Harold and I go with you? I said, sure. So we went on over. Now, this is Tony Clark. She, she could be anything she wanted to be, but she went with me. And Tony, and uh, she had a woman that was living there. There were four of them. So we go up, got up to the top of the VIP line, and I gave this guy the $100 bill, and he snapped his fingers, and through the door behind him came a guy with a table on his head and four guys with chairs on their head, and the guy said, follow them. So I went down in front, all the way down, and I think, they're going to put that table down right in front of the microphone. So uh, we got down there, and they didn't set the table down. He turned and went over here at the end and up the steps. He put the table down behind the curtain and the four chairs. And the guy says, uh, the waiter will come up and take your order. It's 45 minutes till game time, and you'll be fine. So after about 35 or 40 minutes, some of the band starts getting in position. And they see us sitting over there. The, clo the, clo the curtains are closed. And uh, so finally the guy that had the drums, he was over there. You know how they do. They mm -hmm. tune the drum. And uh, pretty quick the curtains opened. There's still no lights on, but the curtain opened. And then some little lights came on because the band needed to see the numbers. So the guys that were in the golf tournament, the guys that were in the golf tournament that day, saw us setting up there, and these guys catcalling us down. Hey King, hey how'd King, how you get a seat like that and so on? <laughs> so we ordered our meal and drinks and stuff, and uh, finally the lights lo uh, lowered out there, and and, uh, and the announcer said, "Ladies and gentlemen." back on tour for the first time in four years to show who's really the king, blah, blah, blah. Elvis Presley, and a door opens right here to our right, maybe 10 feet from my right. right. And he comes walking in, he's got that white thing on. The mm -hmm. famous with, white. Uh -huh. With the, uh, with the uh, cape. cape. And he walks by and he glances back down like this, he says, hey, king, I see you got a good seat. And so he <laughs> walks out and uh, the show starts and uh, he heard these cat calls, and uh, Anne Marie likes me to. I don't. I don't think. I about love this one. Eddie's up there. They're having dinner now. The curtain is wide open, so everybody in the whole audience can see Eddie Fainer, the King, and here's the King, Elvis. And Elvis is getting tired of hearing all these cat calls, and he says, "And ladies and gentlemen, I'd like to tell you." that you have two kings in the building tonight. <laughs> all right. So, and that ended all the cat calls and gave Elvis a chance to carry on. But at the same time, he really appreciated yeah. Eddie and for what he's sure. done. And I would like to point out, everybody who knows anything about Elvis always wears his shirt collar up. Yep. This is Elvis Presley right here. <laughs> I want you to see something. Well, Eddie ain't got it on today. I got it. Uh, I, don't have, it up last yeah, night. I don't have it starch. My husband I, I has always like worn his shirt colors up. Golfers do that. Yep. And uh, I, women always come up and try to put it down. And one of the things that I noticed about that, I says, Eddie, I says, you've worn your colors up long before that. Well, the fun part about all this between Eddie and Elvis is that his name King. Sure. And Elvis, for himself to be able to say, we have more than one king in the building tonight. You know, there's two kings. Gives not only a lot of respect for somebody that we admire, because he was a really good man and very religious, knew that there was a better, better life. Is that in all a lot of the news stories, Eddie is compared to Elvis Presley, the king, sure, Richard Petty, mm -hmm. uh, Jack Nicholas, mm -hmm. Frank Sinatra. Frank Sinatra. And a lot of the headlines I always read 
uh, the king will be appearing in Jamestown, New York. No, not Elvis. <laughs> but for them to have known each other is uh, real touching, and the way Elvis passed away and died uh, because of drugs and liquor, and, and he took the hard road because of the life that we live. Um, Eddie has lived this life bigger than anybody, um, and Elvis evidently had people who really loved him, but they didn't understand that those things were going to kill him. And my king, right here, uh, could have gone the same way, mm -hmm. and he did for quite a while. But he had somebody who took him by the ear, who cared about him, who was an older man, and gave him a real hard lesson in life, and sat him down and explained that, you know, if you don't change your ways, you're going to die. Mm -hmm. And we're really sorry that nobody did that for Elvis. Sure. Who was that guy? The person who was talking is Anne Marie Fainer. Ed Fainer's wife and the first woman to play with the king and his court in 54 years. She's a very accomplished softball player who has a unique story as to how she met and followed the king. To, to you, you were, you've been involved in softball mm -hmm. for a long period of time. Over 30 years. 30 years. I'll leave while she answers that. <laughs> <laughs> no, be, be really, be, before you, obviously, your husband and wife, there was, uh, you played softball, you played softball in a major way. What did Eddie Fainer mean throughout that period of time? I'm one of those people that walk up and say, Eddie, you won't remember me, but uh, when I was nine years old, I got to see the king in Michigan. Uh, my father took me. He coached me all of my life. My dad was a great man. Uh, love children and love the game of softball know that uh, it brings families together mm -hmm. and the King and His Court is a family show. Mm -hmm. So when I got to see Eddie as a child it stuck with me like a lot of men and people today that walk up and tell us. Uh, at the same time I have been considered to be obsessed with the game of softball and it's probably very true. Um, I can't think of anything else but anything to do with the game and children, uh, families. And so about 25 years ago, I got to meet the king. I played a game called the Duke and Duchess versus the king and his court. And at that time, I was a pitcher and a catcher in this particular game I caught. Well, I don't have to tell you who was the duchess. And my biggest dream in life was to become a professional ball player. And uh, in fact, I wanted to be the first Detroit Tiger woman player ever. Mm -hmm. And I got to grow up with Al Kaline and Lolich and Denny McLean. They, uh, Denny actually came to my house. and. Uh, my father got to know these guys, and I got to sit underneath the pool table when they went out after a ball game. I mean, I, got, I was right there. So uh, throughout my life, I've done a lot of different things of running a newspaper, owning a paper, publishing, marketing, advertising, but most importantly, uh, creating softball programs in this country where they were not available for girls. Mm -hmm. um, in other words, I, I know that the kids were just running the streets, and my kids were grown and gone, and it was important to me to help these young women, whether or not it was just to give them a good fundamental uh, recreational avenue to get stress out or stay off of drugs, but to, to be good people <coughs> and create good citizens. And so uh, about after that ball game, the king gave me a t-shirt and, and uh, I was just thrilled. A good friend of mine filmed it and God bless him, he's passed away. And uh, that, that was the greatest day of my life. And like a lot of people who play the King and His Court, it's a very special moment when you meet someone that is, there is no other. Right. He is. And uh, as God would say, I am. Well, he, he is. <clears throat> and so I took a t-shirt and I pinned it up in my closet behind all my evening dresses. And there are days in our lives that we get a little blue and you want to look back on something and puff yourself up. Some people put music on, some people spray certain perfumes like candles oil. Mine was to tear those dresses back and look back on the greatest day of my life. And I moved from place to place and state to state and raised my family and so forth. And oh, about uh, five years ago, Eddie and I met in Titusville. And needless to say, I brought him in to uh, play a few games and be his booking agent. And I was working with him on uh, publishing his book and getting the movie done. And all kinds of things, and uh, one thing led to another, and he did a game up there in Titusville. And uh, he said, I don't know what you're doing with the rest of your life, but if you don't have anything better to do, why don't you come on the road with me? 
<laughs> it'd be better and easier to work together sure. instead of by phone or by email. And I said, well, i got to think about it. So a couple days later, one thing led to another and told him, okay, I'll pack it up and come on the road. And uh, traveling and knowing Eddie, he's my best friend. There's nobody else in the world like him. It's an honor to be with him. More women who are married and men, but women specifically because they've been liberated, need to take a look at what makes a successful relationship. And one of those things is uh, having respect mm -hmm. and uh, not love, but respect mm -hmm. for their other. And if they do that and if they show that, then they'll get that in return without any doubt at all mm -hmm. and uh, without expecting it. And it, it works both ways. And when you're married to somebody like Eddie who uh, gives everything and never asks for anything in return, and knowing that we have such a, a deep faith in God mm -hmm. really makes our life um, a lot more bearable. There are days like yesterday and the day before where we really had a couple hard days to where we would laugh and say, God's just up there laughing at us <laughs> and just saying how much more can they handle. Hmm. And it's an honor to be married to King. He's my best friend. Oh, we've got to close this yeah. out because yeah. it's off after three. Wow. Amory, we told uh, George and I think you were still there last night. Amory uh, had no business uh, marrying me. She had no business sticking with me when I went down. Only well, been with me uh, five weeks. Yeah. And for an average person would say, "Well, I didn't intend to marry an invalid. I'm not going to go to the hospital with you on our honeymoon. I'm going home." I mean, that would have been. I would have never, I never would have not been angry at her for doing that. Yeah. And then I watched her for those first 30 days in the hospital. She wouldn't leave my side. She slept on the bed right beside me on the cot. And she wheeled me through all of my wheelchair days, and taught me how to run a wheelchair, taught me how to do the things. She picks, uh, she packs my pills. I take about a dozen different kind of pills. And uh, it's just the thing that the doctor gives you to keep you uh, at an even keel. Because once you've got to a position like I am, the next stroke will kill me. And I have no artery going from my body up to my brain. It comes up halfway on this side. And this one now spreads up all through my face and up through my leg like this. Because that artery, uh, artery is closed. Mm -hmm. And. Uh, she waits on me hand and foot. I owe my life to her, and uh, if uh, I have five or ten years, so be it. Twenty. Oh, God Twenty-five. Has, God has blessed you. Yeah. yeah. And when that day comes that I have to move on, I want her to be able to say that the king told me to do this, 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 and this, and this, and I'm here to do it. And uh, I hope she takes that wooden bat and the 11 and a half inch ball and our book and the how to pitch book and how to pitch tape and the memorabilia and make the estate something that is powerful, got a lot of money in it, and then go out and what she really wants to do and help the girls. And boys. And, uh, and if, if, uh, I have to go tomorrow, I have no regrets. And uh, like when her dad uh, passed away, it's hard when someone that you love passes away. I don't imagine how the people do it if they don't have faith. Right. But you have faith that you're going to see this guy <laughs> again. And he isn't going to be a cripple. He's going to be running up and down, jumping, and don't have any ailments, mm -hmm. no arthritis, mm -hmm. no pain. Yeah. When you know that that's the future. You don't mind dying today. Sure. Oh, you hate to leave the ones you love, but you're going to meet them again. And uh, if you don't realize, if you don't think this down, when you go to sleep at night, you don't remember being asleep. You go to sleep, you get up the next morning, and you're awake. Mm -hmm. Whether you was asleep an hour or 24 hours, you don't know. When you die, you don't know if you've been dead a hundred years, a thousand years, or two thousand years. When you wake up, 
It's a split second after you die. Mm -hmm. You don't know that time spent. So when I die, I'm going to see Anne Marie standing right there. It may All be right. it may be a hundred years from now. It may be next month. But there's no time lag. When you die, the next conscious thought you have, you're going to be looking right at your maker or your friend or love or whatever. We hope we have a chance to see you again. I don't know if they're going to cure arthritis. We have over 2,000 cures, but none of them work. That's the people's heart to come out and tell me this works and this works. If you have me taking this, you can take my word for it. We've taken it all, including that guy that wanted us to drink a gallon of salt water every day. But uh, I think I'm going to have my right knee replaced this winter. We hope we have a chance to come back and play it for you. Whether we do or not, we'll be up to uh, Anne Marie and the guys. I'm going to be out here doing the show that I did for you tonight, most of it. Maybe I don't do the really pitching the game. Thanks for bringing us in. Thank you very much. Good night. say thank you for sharing these extraordinary insights into your life and your magnificent barnstorming career which has been which has exceeded more than 55 years of entertaining millions of fans throughout the world thanks for the memories started in Chicago with the Farragut Boat Club. They wrapped up a boxing glove and hit it with a broomstick handle. And slow pitch, what we now call slow pitch, was born, where the pitcher was not allowed to strike out the batter. You just let it go as if you're pitching horseshoes. So we went to what we now call softball, a 12-inch softball, but they were still not allowed to strike out the batter. With the ball being smaller, they hit it farther, so the pitcher started throwing it with more speed on it, what we call modified slow pitch. Then it went to what we call orthodox. And the pitchers were not allowed to wear a glove to hide the ball in, so to keep the batter from seeing how you held the ball, you had to have some way to cover it. Well, the pitchers that pitched orthodox would go like this. But we started throwing slingshot and then windmill. And when we threw windmill, we threw the twist. So you really couldn't see how you held the ball. Well, by now, the game started speeding up and we are allowed to wear a glove. And with the glove, the pitcher was able to keep the bat from seeing how you held the ball. When we would throw the ball, we keep the ball completely covered all the way through the windup. You'd have fellows that would throw windmill with one time around. Some fellows would throw it many times around. And then there was a guy that threw it this way. Here, pitcher Eddie Fainer shows the bewildering technique with which he strikes out an average of 17 batters per game. Playing against capable nine-man teams, Fainer and his three teammates have won 378 games while losing only 56. Fainer says he can pitch two full games without throwing the same pitch twice. While barnstorming around the country, Fainer pitches every day, sometimes in both games of a doubleheader. 
pity the batter who never knows when or from where the ball is coming. As if his duties on the mound weren't enough, Fainer must often cover first when a lucky batter connects. Even an outfield hit will be retrieved by the infield, which consists of a shortstop and a first baseman. They allow an average of less than one and a half runs per game. Maybe Fainer looks like he isn't going to try a pickoff play, but watch him. Because they can't get enough teams to risk playing them, the King and his court have signed up with a nine-man team, which, as you might expect, has become a softball terror. Hello, I'm Jack Knight, and it's been my good fortune to be part of the King and his court since 1981, and my pleasure now to be your host for this nostalgic look at the highlights of the best-loved, longest-running, most highly awarded, and truly entertaining softball exhibition shows in sports history. A story that, as Eddie said, all started on a dare. Just a few months out of service with the Marine Corps in World War II, Eddie, like other returning servicemen, was finding it difficult to get a steady job. But a good pitcher could often find a job with a company team that sponsored a competitive group and Eddie was a very good pitcher. At one time or another, he hooked up with Grimshaw Tires and one of the better teams in the Northwest at that time, the Turling Construction Company. Early in 1946, Eddie hooked up with some fellas to play a game south of the border in Oregon. Uh, it was a rout, and after the game, the losers got to name calling. Well, Eddie being as boastful and cocky as he could be, said that he could play them again and beat them with only his catcher but that they'd probably walk them both. Well, the other team dared him uh, to put his quite valuable reputation on the line and play him with only four players. Well, the gauntlet having been thrown down, the king turned to three of his teammates to rise to the occasion. Meade Kinzer, his catcher since grade school. Mike Mileke, later dubbed the Ted Williams of softball, the shortstop and power-hitting first baseman, Kenny White. They played a few scrimmage games at the local prison to get their defenses straight and accepted the challenge. The result of that fateful game was a rout. In the stands was a promoter from Idaho. He suggested a second game over his way. Well, that game was a rout too, no surprise. Big surprise was the King's share of the gate. More money than they were making on their regular jobs. They named themselves the King and his Court, and the four barnstormers extraordinaire were on the road. And Jerry Jones joined the team because he was the only one with a car. The first game played under the King and his Court banner was booked up in Trail, British Columbia, up in Canada, by Art Masisco. He's seen here, and on the right, Fergie Ferguson. He was one of the players on the team that lost that night. Well, there were lots more games that summer and more in 1947-48. And then, after a number of victories, they met up with Bo Willis. They were playing nose-to-nose, -nose, straight up. Yeah, they, uh, they came down to Eugene and we played them and uh, they had just won 86 straight games. And I couldn't tell you today what the score was. Bo Willis was a heck of a gentleman and a heck of a pitcher. There were very few losses over those first years and the ratio over history is 12 to 1. And sometimes we played 200 games in a season without a loss. Well, the team continued to play nine-man ball in those early years, and in 1952, they hooked up with the Miami Flyers. 1953 found them in the NSC Tournament Championship Finals. Well, they lost, but Eddie was named 1953 First Team All-American. By that time, the team could truly say that they were world champions. In 1950, they had beaten the tip-top Taylors from Toronto, who were the reigning champions at that time. And the King and his court had gained international recognition. But the King and his court was not the only team to enjoy popularity. 
Of course, they were the Harlem Globetrotters, the House of David baseball team. They were clowns. The Iowa Colored Ghost baseball team was one incarnation of teams with the same name. This one was managed by Rip Collins. Showboat Clay led the Harlem Clowns. And the incomparable dribbler Marcus Haynes was with the Harlem Magicians for over 30 years, and countless others. They say that imitation is the sincerest form of flattery, and so it was with the king and his court. Several teams popped up trying to capitalize on the success and popularity of the king and his court. There was a Canadian team called Prince and his Knights. There was Rosie Black, great, great woman pitcher who fronted the queen and her maids, later the queen and her court. The Philadelphia Hobos had a comedy group and their pitcher pitched on stilts. Rich Hoppy toured with his group, Hoppy and the Hushless, before he joined the court. And the absolute finest sports comedian, Gary West, a longtime member of the court, took a few years off for touring to go with another comedy great, Trino Palacios and the California Cuties, and later with his own group, Softball Fever. Because of the unique nature of the show, the court drew more media attention than most. Here's an early newsreel feature, a clip from the 1950s. Here, Eddie warms up before the game with a blazing crossfire drop. Now the team is ready and all set to go with young Eddie Jr. as bat boy. Uh-oh, this batter is in big trouble with that tricky windup. And the crowd loves Eddie's between-the-legs delivery. This rookie changeup didn't fool the batter. This time, resulting in a rare base hit. For the man on base, watch for a no-look behind-the-back pickoff try. Ooh, that was close. Now pitching on his knees, the King gets an easy out on a grounder to short. Now it's the court's time to go to work at bat. Here's Jerry Jones booming a home run with a man on. Imagine how the batter feels when he faces the King pitching blindfolded. Here's the strikeout in slow motion. Strike three! You're out! And another batter goes down swinging. from second base, the King gets a strike on the batter before he gives up another rare hit. But the threat has ended when the fabulous whirly gig behind the back phantom third strike pitch comes right in there. Or did it? When the batter was called out, he complained that the pitch was high. A round of handshakes and the King shows the crowd the phantom pitch one more time. A final demonstration pitch and another sensational show from the King and his court is in the books. In Eddie's heyday, radar guns were far in the future. But on the day after the court beat the tip-top tailors at the Canadian National Exposition in 1950, 
Scientists at the University of Windsor, Ontario, near Detroit, used new high-speed military cameras intended for use in ballistics to check the speed of Eddie's fastball. After 40 pitches, filming from all angles, they concluded that the King was throwing over 104 miles an hour. The second generation of the court features Eddie's son, J.R., Al Jackson, and Gary West. Here's a promo film Eddie produced in that era. I'm Eddie Thainer. If you're into softball, you might recognize the name. If not, you might have heard of me as a pitcher of the original four-man softball team called the King and His Court. 1976 will represent our 31st year on tour. If you haven't seen this great team yet, you may want to come out and see us this year. We'll be playing here this week. You know, I guess we're just about the most unique sports show in the world, with the possible exception of the Hardham Globetrotters. As a matter of fact, you might say our show is very much like the Hardham Globetrotters because we combine comedy with the ability to play a game better, I guess, than anybody in the world. And we have played in over 3,000 different cities. Who are the other players, Eddie? I'm glad you asked. Take Al Jackson, for instance. Al's playing in his 19th season with the King and his court. An interesting fact about Al is that he once came to bat 421 times without a second. Al's also hit more home runs to this date than Hank Aaron. Come on out and see Al hit and play first base. He may hit a home run for you. Then there's J.R. Fainer. If the name sounds familiar to you, it's because J.R. is my son. But he's not a member of the King's Court because we're related. J.R. happens to be one of the best hitters and can play all the positions equally well, including catching me. And that's something I can never do. For comedy relief, we've got the routines of Gary West. I can't really describe to you how funny this man really is. But I guarantee that when Gary does his stuff, you'll see a combination of comedy and ball playing unmatched by anybody on the circuit today. The newest member of the Kenya's court is the great catcher from the pro leagues in Western Canada, Les Barber. Les makes catching me look easy. Because he's so smooth and agile behind the plate, with those long arms, he seems to catch anything I throw without worrying about signals or anything else. As for my role in the show, I naturally have the modest title of the king. Of course, that's what the other people who see the act call me. Actually, my name really was King. Here are some samples of just what I do in our show. If you've not seen our show, I think you ought to come see it. We're going to be playing against a very fine nine-man team made up of local ball players here this week. And if you've seen the show before, you'll enjoy it again, because this team can really hit. It's a little known fact that besides being the best softball pitcher in history, Eddie Fainer was quite a bowler. This is his personal ball, 16 pounder, has his name on it. He started out as a pin setter and eventually ended up in the Washington State Championships. He's rolled a couple of 300 games and in an exhibition at the New York Coliseum for AMF automatic pin setters, he bowled with Frank Krause and Hall of Famer Lou Campy. At that time, he bowled a 4-7, 6-10 split, and made it, blindfolded, and between his legs. I'm no golfer, but Eddie is. He started playing golf almost at the same time he started pitching. And Sam Sneed, the immortal Hall of Famer, actually gave him his first set of clubs and golf shoes. He's played in over 300 pro-am and celebrity tournaments, with the great players of the day and socially, his list of partners has included a who's who of international and national celebrities. In a 1967 fundraiser at Dodger Stadium, with celebrities including Clint Eastwood, Steve Allen, Beverly Hill Billy Max Baer, 
and Get Smart's Don Adams, Celebrities manager Leo the Lip de Rocher put Eddie in the game to pitch against an impressive lineup of major leaguers. He faced Roberto Clemente, Maury Wills, Willie McCovey, Brooks Robinson, Harmon Killebrew, and Willie Mays. The King struck them all out in succession and Cade Pete Rose twice. I guess if Paul Bunyan had been a softball player, he might have used a bat as big as this. Man, this is heavy and hard to swing. So, instead of swinging a bat like that, the king became famous for using a bat that was only 22 inches long. At first, he used it to bunt with, but then used to take full swings. As a matter of fact, on the CBS Sports Spectacular in 1972 with Jack Whitaker, he actually hit a ball out of the park with this diminutive little bat. Anecdotally, it was Amos Alonzo Stagg, the immortal college football coach, who gave Eddie the idea. Eddie also used this bat for a while, playing with the court. He designed it himself. It has a flat surface, much flatter than with a regular round bat. You've got more flat surface to hit the ball. And it's kind of triangle shape. I used to use this. Could hit it a long way. Eddie's appeared in benefits and shows for just about every cause that there is. But one of the recognition plaques that he received stands out in his memory. It was the first televised muscular dystrophy telethon and this plaque from Jerry Lewis. Ladies and gentlemen, the man who made lethal weapon more powerful with his explosive presence, Danny Glover. And now we present a special Victor Ward to someone who may be the greatest pitcher who ever pitched a game. When he first started out, his fastball had been clocked at 100 miles an hour. Now, at this point, you must have guessed that I'm talking about Sandy Koufax or Lefty Gomez or Bob Feller, but you guessed wrong. Put them all together, throw in Nolan Ryan, Steve Carlton, and Walter Johnson, Add up all their winning games and strikeouts, and you still don't have the answer. Sandy Koufax never won 200 games a year. This man did. The immortal Christy Matheson didn't have 1,000 no-hit victories. This man did. All the names I just mentioned together didn't come anywhere near to pitching 120,000 strikeouts. The man we're honoring tonight did all that, and he did it underhand with a softball he's truly the king and the others on his team are called his court and they take on all comers the difference is there are only four players on their team and all the teams they play against have nine on their side and the king and his court still win eight out of every nine games they play and after 44 years of doing it He's still pitching 200 games a year, every year. Of course, he's slowed up a bit lately. Today, at age 64, he only pitches at 90 miles an hour. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, a special victory award to the king, the great Mr. Eddie Fainer. <laughs> Thank you very much, City of Hope, and the Sporting News. I don't know how to express myself, actually. We've been out here 44 years, and I thank more than you know for this uh, award, and God bless you. In the 1980s, in Japan, one of their top reality TV shows was called Challenger. They sent a popular Japanese comedian to California for a tryout with the king in his court, Koji Ishiyama. As a part of the show, the producers asked the king, could you possibly knock a juice can off of a tripod with a pitch? Well, the can was about a third the size of this. In two out of three pitches, he knocked the can off. Here's a shot of it. Here's another one in slow motion. 
Here's another look. The king demonstrated his skill at all kinds of venues. Here he is at Bally's Casino in Nevada, throwing blindfolded into the heart of the matter. As a former serviceman, Eddie has always had our military at heart. In fact, in 1991, he dedicated the souvenir book that year to the troops, veterans of Desert Storm, right here. Thanks to our troops, well done. The number of military bases he's played at here and abroad on ships at sea is enormous. As a matter of fact, I've been told that Eddie has done more shows for the military than the incomparable Bob Hope. Our 1989 military tour in Korea was a court favorite because we got to lay over in Hawaii for games at Pearl Harbor on the way to Seoul. The King gave Dave Booth, Craig Van Poyen, Gary West and I the day off. I'm behind the camera. We got some refreshments and did some beach combing at Waikiki. After checking out the locals, we all went down to the beach to mix and mingle, and Lucky Dave met up with a very lovely young lady. Later on, we paid a visit to the Arizona Memorial, which seemed an appropriate way to get ready for our shows for the GIs. Playing tourist in Seoul, the court visited the Olympic Stadium, site of the 1988 Olympic Games, and then made the very long and arduous climb up to the Seoul Tower. Among the many camps we played, Camp Boniface was the most poignant. It's situated on the 38th parallel, where troops are on 32nd alert. It features the Panmunjom tour of the DMZ, with visits to the Peace Pagoda, and, however briefly, North Korea, via the UN-North Korea Joint Meeting Room. Playing for the troops, however, was the best part of it all. <laughs> Before they were married, Eddie's wife, Anne Marie, was the court marketing director. She's been involved with softball since she was a teenager, having played on a Michigan state championship team and received a state athlete of the year award presented to her by major league slugger Harmon Killebrew. She promoted and coached for many years, and besides taking over operation of the court, has joined the team at first base the only woman to do so in court history, and she holds up her end of the show like a pro. In the spring of 1999 in Moore, Oklahoma, the court faced the most formidable opponent in tour history, much more overwhelming than the 10-time national champions Clearwater Bombers, hitting with more power than the perennial Midwest juggernaut, the Zollner Pistons, and with more speed than the king himself. The opposition that day, a Force 5 tornado, half a mile wide, traveling erratically with upper winds of 318 miles per hour, highest in recorded history. Taking cover in their motel, they said their prayers, made their goodbyes, and waited. The aftermath was one of total destruction. The King's car was under the second floor balcony, and the tour van was badly damaged, but drivable. They all found shelter in another motel, salvaged their gear, postponed the next game, rented a van, and continued the schedule. Just another typical day on tour with the king and his court. This distinctive red, white, and blue glove has graced many softball fields over the years, and Eddie's favorite ball, the Harvard 100, along with it. But perhaps the most important appearance was at the 2000 Olympic Games. The King and Anne Marie threw out the first ball. Today, Rich Hoppy, former world tournament MVP and longtime court member, has taken up the pitching duties for the court and continues the traditional mix of super softball and comedy while the King does the show from the sidelines. Long ball hitter Dave Booth handles the catching these days, and Bobby Hale out of Nova Scotia, Canada, is our utility man. The year 2000 marked Eddie's 75th birthday. After a game in Lakewood, California, several players and friends convened at the Long Beach Holiday Inn to reminisce and celebrate the King's 75th, complete with decorations and a cake. Among the current and former players were the King's son, J.R., Gary West, Rich Hoppy, Floyd Berger, Doug Potts, 
Eddie O'Coin, Mark Bailey, Jim Herrick, Norm Fingston, myself, and the King's wife, Anne Marie. And oh, the stories they told. Over 50 players have worn the King and his court uniform in its history, all contributing to super fast pitch action, comedy, and family fun. Decades of it. In the future, another generation of players will follow in the footsteps of the greatest, Eddie Fainer, the King of Softball. If you'd like to book a game with the King and his court, or purchase King and his court souvenirs and memorabilia, call 1-800-627-3522 or go to www.kingandhiscourt.com.